Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti. I'm just incredible. Unbelievable. For the past six weeks, we really got to understand the mindset uh, of the gangster himself, New Jack. Now we continue this great, phenomenal Wrestling Insider series that's getting positive feedback, not only around the corner, not only around the country, but around the world, brother. It's going to be exciting to dive in a little further and see all the extreme and uh, different personalities in ECW. Wrestling Inside is Extreme is now. Tickets are on sale now for our 20th anniversary Back to the 80s and 90s WrestleFest Birthday Bash, Saturday, November the 13th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Massachusetts. This is Mick Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL, and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti, joined by the former ECW World Heavyweight Champion, Just Incredible. If for some reason he doesn't like to put that over, I don't get it. Oh, you but know. You know, that's your thing, brother. You gotta put it over. I try. You gotta put it over. I try once in a while. I tell you, what a series this has become. ECW, no matter how uh, quote unquote old the content and the footage get, how long ago it's been since those extreme events took place at the arena, uh, in Queens, on pay per view. The love for that promotion will never die. And we're going to dive into it very deep as this series continues. Yeah. But maybe just uh, a few sentences. Why is there so much love for this promotion that hasn't truly existed outside of the WWE form now in just a little bit over 20 years? Well, I mean, it just uh, shows, you know, the, the kind of promotion it was, the the kind of groundbreaking stuff ECW was doing. I mean, very rarely do we talk or celebrate WCW, um, you know, and we're still to this day, 20 plus years later, talking about ECW because not only did the characters change the way the business was, the way Paul Heyman and the way we told stories changed the business. And, uh, you know, to this day, um, our effect is still being seen all over the wrestling world. WWE never brought back a retro ECW on the Sci-Fi Channel for five years. <laughs> so what does that tell you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think it goes without saying many of the fans um, had, were interested in your thoughts um, before, again, we talk more about you and your ECW experiences about the man that kicked off the series for the first six weeks, uh, the late Jerome Young, New Jack, yeah. just shocking. We had him here in May. The episodes were excellent, as I don't, I'm sure you've seen. We had so much fun, so many laughs for all the people that were kind of, oh, you have a new jacket at the studio? And <laughs> I don't think we could have had more fun. And we right. had a great dinner up at the Kowloon Entertainment and Dining Complex on Route 1 in Saugus that all the boys love so much. And just, I will never forget six nights later being at Fenway Park for a Red Sox game for the first time in a year and a half. The Corona rules were still in effect. I think they, you could only have 5,000 people in the park. And I thought my phone broke because it just it wouldn't stop buzzing. That's how many messages I was getting when the news broke that he had passed away. So the fans had asked, in your experience with him, I believe he was there during your entire tenure, oh, yeah. Yeah. your memories, your thoughts on, on the late New Jack? I mean, he was definitely, what made him so special is he was himself. He was, it was unadulterated the way New Jack was on camera and off, which, you know, uh, not very many places would uh, ever consider uh, having somebody like that, too risky, too controversial. But, uh, you know, what people don't know when the cameras are off is uh, he's got a real sweet and gentle side that he showed, uh, you know, to friends and family. And I got the pleasure of seeing that. But uh, it truly really was a, an amazing, complex human being. And uh, I was just blessed to share the ring with him, blessed to share a locker room with him. And the fans as well, uh, blessed to kind of witness uh, what we call, you know, the gangster New Jack. You know, I think it's great that they produced that Dark Side of the Ring episode on yeah. him. I think they did a fair job, if nothing else. Uh, you know, the one thing I wish they had included, and I, I have tried to mention it in different interviews we've done, is just the tremendous, and it's so sad that he's gone, but the tremendous end of life that he did have. We, I'm not sure what happened, whether it was an in-ring injury or just an illness, but he was hospitalized in Atlantic City for quite a bit. Yeah. Um, he said... You know, he had a lot of friends in that area, you know, sure. Atlantic City, Philadelphia, and so on. And he said he felt like no one really cared. Yeah. And he heard from a fan down in North Carolina 
and they would interact, I think it was Facebook, they were going back and forth on, back and forth on. And after a couple of weeks, she actually drove up from North Carolina to Atlantic oh, wow. City to see him. And he wound up marrying her, the yeah. lovely Jennifer. And okay. she had three young kids of her own. And I remember asking him in Kowloon, I said, what was it like for you if they ever, you know, Googled you or looked you up on YouTube right. to move into their home and become <laughs> stepdad? And he said, you want to know the truth? They look at me like I'm a big toy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the side of him I think you were just trying to describe a minute right. ago. Beyond the ultra-violence yeah. in extreme presentation, no pun intended, that he had in ECW, and then on the independence after the fact, there was such a, a golden side to him. Yeah. And that's funny because one of the first times I ever met him when ECW started to come up here was the coolest incident, yeah. which I'm sure you've yeah. <laughs> probably oh, yeah. seen. Yeah. And I, I, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. That yelp that came from him. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that, that in, in those days, man, I, I tell you, things were a bit different. And uh, we took what we did uh, very seriously in the ring. And, uh, you know, I, you know I had, in no means am I saying that the young man had it coming, but you sort of, when you get into the ring, you are, you're crossing a line, and it's only meant for professionals. I wasn't there that night, thank God. But uh, word on the street was he was, uh, he was not trained and he didn't belong right. in the ring. And I think New Jack uh, took offense. And, of course, Paul Heyman definitely egged on the situation to make it what it was, which was a, uh, a huge fallout, but it got people talking. And as Eric Bischoff has said, controversy, whether good or bad, creates cash. And uh, it helped build that fear of New Jack. That, uh, in the promotion itself yeah. to people that weren't familiar with it. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I have never, in 28 years now, have ever seen anything like what he did yeah. to that poor soul that night. You know, rest in peace, sorry he's gone. But you know what? You want to show up at an event? You want to say you were a Kowalski guy and so on and yeah. so forth? You want to run your mouth and put yourself in a big position like that? Not to say that it didn't go a little too far. Absolutely. But you know no. what? That's what happens when you want to play with the big boys, with yeah. the true pros. And, yeah. you know... It, Unfortunately, he was banned from Wonderland Greyhound Park for a full year. Yeah. Funny enough, that's where we had our first live event back in 2001 after ECW had closed down. But um, no, just a shame. Again, you said it almost took the thoughts out of my mind. Just yeah. such a, a dangerous persona that, wow, I, and that's missing in pro wrestling in general right now, I would not want to fuck with this human being. Right. And yeah. again, if you got to know him well enough or got on his good side, you get to see the fun and the humor and yep. the, just the, the genuine belly laughs that you yep. could have with him. Absolutely. But you wouldn't want to cross him. No. He had no problems adjusting an attitude if it needed to be adjusting. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just my, my great, other than being so sorry that he passed, um, you know, I still message with Jennifer on social media from time to time because you know what? You know, the, the guy shouldn't be forgotten after no. a week or two. No. That's one of my big problems with the what was, and you, you're around long enough, to remember when this was a brotherhood. Right. When we were taught, yeah. you know what, everybody wants the best spot. Everybody wants to make the most money. But other than that, it's a, a fraternity. It's yeah. a brotherhood. We should be here to look after each other and try and help each other out. Yeah. That's why I think this studio is such a great thing. It gives guys an easy opportunity to make extra income to live their lives sure. just by flying in or driving in, telling their stories and yeah. going home. It's yeah. simple, and we've been doing it now. The first one we did, I don't know if you're familiar with it, was with the Iron Sheik, uh, <laughs> where he showed up with no teeth after a wild cocaine binge, talking about wanting to rape Brian Blair and Hulk Hogan. And that must I, have been a hell of an episode. It was on the Howard Stern Show. Oh, that's what got him started with Howard. Yes. <laughs> Some, in the infancy of YouTube, before yeah. things... Before the term viral became a, a thing, term, yeah. someone from Howard found it on the clip on YouTube about the Sheik wanting to rape all of these former co-workers, mm -hmm. and they were playing it every day. And the cool thing was, at one point, they were going to bring him in, and they wanted to use the actual footage. But for that, they needed, you know, copyrights and so sure, on and yeah. so forth. Yeah, yeah. So we worked out a deal where they gave us advertising for our live events so they could use the footage of the audio they were already using. So it worked out for everybody. Yeah, everybody wins, sure. They that's, had that's the amazing. fun they had with him for however long until it got stale. Yeah. And it helped us in promoting our live events to such and a And it huge. helped Sheik, really. And the Sheik. Yeah. You know, the live bookings. I mean, the bookings we were able to get for him out of that. Uh, oh, I can imagine. Oh, God. 
You know, the sheik, when Matt Cain fell over, that was as a result of him. I don't want to get into, I'll tell you that story sometime, <laughs> it'll come up. But honestly, no, we get, because of his drug-induced nonsense and a long, long delay of leaving a venue, yeah. we get hit by a drunk driver that almost killed us. Really? Yeah. So I went from being a 24-year-old kid to a oh crippled guy. Oh, my goodness. The sheik's wow. foot. I don't know if you've ever seen sheik try and walk over the past 15 years, but it's almost like the foot has shifted and he's walking on the bottom of his ankle. Oh, wow. And the sad thing is, not to, again, a lot of the fans have heard this story, but he signed on with an ambulance chaser really quick, and the kid that hit us, he was a year younger than me, so he didn't have anything. He had the max insurance of what he had for policy, right. which wasn't much. Right. So once this ambulance, uh, ambulance chaser attorney realized that, he just basically said, screw it. It had nothing to do with the sheik. Sheiky Baby never got a penny from the car accident. Really? Not to say that I got anywhere near what I deserve for a life-altering injury. Of course, yeah. You know, it was something to live off of for the better part of a year as opposed wow. to nothing. Yeah, but still, wow. But That's anyway. <laughs> I never knew that one. I don't even know how the hell the Sheik came up. Sheik always, oh, different interviews we've had here in the studio. Well, to me, that's what it's about. I wish we could get to the point where there's so much fan support. We could do this, have guys in here seven days a week to come yeah. and tell their stories. Yeah, that would be a great thing. WWE Network, WWE is not going to make a three-disc DVD of every star they ever had. But that doesn't mean their stories, their experiences, their sacrifices shouldn't be documented and they shouldn't be available yeah. for fans to learn from and enjoy. And, and I think that's a, that's a huge mistake in something that has been so big in the, uh, the shoot interview world and, the other, and other, you know, with, with YouTube and Feinstein, RF Video and all those guys, is that, that other part of the scene that isn't necessarily in the WWE or not on the WWE Network that people would like to know about. And because uh, there's so many generations of guys and gals out there um, with, with long careers that, you know, you would think have, you know, disappeared off the face of the earth when in right. reality they've been on the scene hustling. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's a great idea. And I'm glad that somebody's recognizing it. Well, we can only do what we can do. That's it. Uh, you know, you, I, I always wonder sometimes if, if this place is haunted when I think of so many guys that have been here that have passed away and... You know, I think when, when you talk to someone like that and you bear your soul, I think a little part of that stays where you are. I don't know how much of a spiritual person you may be, but um, anyway, tell us about a young P.J. Polacco. Are you a Connecticut guy? Yeah, born and raised in Connecticut. Tell me what got you interested. As a, I don't know how old you were when you started watching, but tell us about yeah. your introduction to just seeing professional wrestling. Man, I had to be maybe 12 years old. A little uh, older, okay. Yeah, and okay. I think like a lot of uh, kids that get into it, I just uh, tuned uh, into, I think it was like Saturday Morning Superstars, and I remember Hulk Hogan was pinning the Iron Sheik to win the WWF title for the first time. And uh, from then, you know, from there, it just started to slowly develop into, you know, just seeing all these, all these cool people and what was going on, and I didn't know if it was real or fake, because um, not everybody was into wrestling yet at that time. This was right before going into like WrestleMania one, and uh, just from there, really, uh, you know, wanting to stay up for Saturday night's main event, and you know, all the other cool stuff that was happening is when I really kind of got into it as a kid. I don't think the fans of today they can read all the books, they can watch mm. all the interviews yeah. they want to watch. I don't think they can realize how hot and how mainstream it was from. 85 through 89-ish. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was yeah. everywhere. It was pop culture. It helped put MTV on the map. Yeah, it really did. It helped put it really MTV on huge. the map. It was huge, yeah. People can say, oh, you know, TBS and Ted Turner, they had the first wrestling show, Georgia Championship Wrestling, that was broadcast around the country. And not to say that that wasn't huge. Right, right. But WWF was part of everything. It was just miles away from New York City. The talent became superstars as they were able to get on these mainstream programs. As you mentioned with Saturday Night's Main Event, I mean, it was replacing one of the hottest shows on television right. in Saturday Night Live yep. every four to six weeks. Yeah, which is a huge deal. That's a very big deal, you know. You fast forward even a couple of years beyond that, uh, from 88 through 91, they gave them that one primetime special per year on the Friday right. Night, yep. the, main event, the main event, to lead Absolutely. into WrestleMania. Hogan and Andre in 1988 did 33 million people. Jeez. They struggled to hit two on Raw most weeks now. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, granted, there's online platforms and there's more channels. And I know there's a million excuses people can make, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, 
33 million human beings decided right. to tune in yeah. to watch Hulk Hogan and Andre that That's night. a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Then the next day, they did a matinee right here in Boston. They, mm -hmm. It was Hogan and Bam Bam against Andre and DiBiase. Hours after the big title shenanigans, yep. sold out Boston. Then they flew down to Philadelphia that night, sold out the Spectrum with the same main event, Hogan and Bam Bam against Andre and DiBiase. Yeah. You can't get much hotter than that. No, no those, those were unique times. Just I mean, look at the loops. Crazy, yeah. On your A team, you got Hulk. Mm -hmm. On your B team, you got Randy. On the C team, you got Warrior. Yeah. They even had D teams sometimes on just weekends when they could line up little college and high school shows. Yeah. You could not be any hotter than that company was. And again, it wasn't just hot to wrestling fans. It was just casual human beings that said, right. I want to I see what this Hulk Hogan thing is. Yeah. Where I go to the pharmacy to get my medication. I remember the woman giving me my medication. I don't know how wrestling came up, but you know, she said, oh my God, back in whatever year it was, I actually went to Boston because I wanted to see what it was. Yeah. Because it was everywhere. Well, pro wrestling was such a different... It, it's something weird about wrestling and wonderfully weird because people watch it, they kind of don't... They know it's not real, but they are so interested in like, well, how, do, how, do, how was it done? Well, that looked real, that wasn't real. And then it's, it's just that question that's forever looming. Now with things so much oh, further yeah. out there, but still, there's an attraction to it. Yeah. There's some side of many people, people that will never admit it, that like pro wrestling for whatever reason. And I think that's, that's, that's a special part of, of what pro wrestling is. And it's just evolved a bit um, into what it is today, really. But there's always been a, uh, whether you admit it or not, some side of someone uh, has been kind of, what's, what's that car crash all about, you know? I, I agree with you 100%. I remember my father used to hate. Oh hate to take me to the Boston Garden every month. And right around the time of WrestleMania three, I think he'd had it after about six or seven months in a row. And he said, you know, this is all fake. And I'm like, well, and as I'd later learn, once I get into the industry, I wasn't really wrong. How can they do that without that hurt? Right. I mean, you can see some punches and certain things and kicks and sure. so on and so forth. But there are things that are done that are gonna harm the human body, no matter how you wanna uh, categorize the industry. Well, I think what that the dismissive part about it was actually as f further off from the truth than anybody can imagine, right? Because if when I learned about it, I was like, it's a lot realer than people think, and it, and I found this out when I started to do jobs. I was an extra mm -hmm. uh, for like Monday Night Raw. You're going in there and you're barely talking to any of these 300 pound monsters that you're about to face, and if they if they wanted to go in there and shoot on you and and really turn the tides on you, they can do whatever they want. So, I mean, to say that it's fake really was like, you know, we would, you know, the people would say like, oh, that's what they're supposed to say. But I don't think anybody realizes it's, it's a little, it, you know, it doesn't do it justice at all. I mean, that's why fake has such a bad connotation. I, oh, does that bother me? Uh, definitely uh, staged or right. w I worked is the best, uh, the best word for it. But man, to say that it's fake, I mean, I, 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 those guys beat the crap out of me so many times. I know we got the cue from our buddy Lou Dater in the back to go to the commercial break, but before oh. we go, simply as a man that actually did it, as opposed to someone reading about it online, sure. would you compare the abuse that your body went through to other professional sports as a basketball player, a football player? Oh, I would certainly say football. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say more so than basketball because just the weird terror. Constant contact. Yeah. 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 Not to mention head injuries. Well, which I've had well over a dozen concussions, and we all know. CTE, yeah, we've done a lot of work with Chris Nowinski. No, oh, yeah, right up here in Hartford. Yeah, has. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, good, good guy. All yeah. right, wrestling fans, right now we got the cue from the back as Lou Data switches to the hot cam. We are here with the former ECW World Champion, Just Incredible, in his premiere episode. We'll be back after this brief time up. Tickets are on sale now for our 20th anniversary Back to the 80s and 90s WrestleFest Birthday Bash Saturday, November the 13th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Massachusetts. The World Wrestling Federation was live at the Wichita Coliseum in Wichita, Kansas, Sunday, October the 19th, 1997. In the opening contest, Rocky Maivia and Farouk beat the new Blackjacks. Crush and Chains with the win over Kama and D'Lo Brown. The Patriot defeated the Sultan. WWF Intercontinental Champion Owen Hart retained the title over Dude Love. 
Ken Shamrock victorious over Savio Vega. WWF Tag Team Champions The Legion of Doom retain the titles over the Godwins. And in the main event, WWF World Champion Brett Hitman Hart retain the title over The Undertaker and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. If you were in Wichita Live, share your memories in the comment section below. Use the links in the description box to keep wrestling legends working on our eBay store and on our Patreon streaming service so we can bring you more interactive superstar shoot interviews to relive the good old days of professional wrestling. Check it out. Boston Wrestling Sports in the MWF explodes into a new year with professional wrestling content galore and need you to join our family. Every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. after our Monday Night Raw review, it's Wrestling Inside Us at your house with WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. after NXT and AEW, join rotating legends on Wrestling Insiders Special Edition. Every Thursday night at 10 p.m. after our NXT and Dynamite review, it's Marty Jannetty's No Holds Barred Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Journey on Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty. Friday night after SmackDown, don't miss John Cena Sr.'s Wrestling Insiders Fabulous Fridays. Plus, look for classic clips, history videos, bonus live episodes, pay per view, watch alongs, and more. For less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, get early ad free access to our Wrestling Insider talk shows, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library, and help keep wrestling legends working during the worst of times join our growing family at patreon.com backslash boston wrestling expect the unexpected in 2021 tickets are on sale now for our 20th anniversary back to the 80s and 90s wrestlefest birthday bash saturday november the 13th at memorial hall in melrose massachusetts the World Wrestling Federation was live at the Wichita Coliseum in Wichita, Kansas, Sunday, October the 19th, 1997. In the opening contest, Rocky Maivia and Farouk beat the new Blackjacks. Crush and Janes with the win over Kama and D'Lo Brown. The Patriot defeated the Sultan. WWF Intercontinental Champion Owen Hart retained the title over Dude Love. Ken Shamrock victorious over Savio Vega. WWF Tag Team Champions The Legion of Doom retain the titles over the Godwins. And in the main event, WWF World Champion Bret Hitman Hart retain the title over The Undertaker and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. If you were in Wichita Live, share your memories in the comment section below. Use the links in the description box to keep wrestling legends working on our eBay store and on our Patreon streaming service so we can bring you more interactive superstar shoot interviews to relive the good old days of professional wrestling. Check it out. Boston Wrestling Sports in the MWF explodes into a new year with professional wrestling content galore and need you to join our family. Every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. after our Monday Night Raw review, it's Wrestling Inside Us at your house with WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. after NXT and AEW, join rotating legends on Wrestling Insiders Special Edition. Every Thursday night at 10 p.m. after our NXT and Dynamite review, it's Marty Jannetty's No Holds Barred Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Journey on Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty. Friday night after SmackDown, don't miss John Cena Sr.'s Wrestling Insiders Fabulous Fridays. Plus, look for classic clips, history videos, bonus live episodes, pay per view, watch alongs, and more. For less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, get early ad free access to our Wrestling Insider talk shows, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library, and help keep wrestling legends working during the worst of times join our growing family at patreon.com backslash boston wrestling expect the unexpected in 2021 tickets are on sale now for our 20th anniversary back to the 80s and 90s wrestlefest birthday bash saturday november the 13th at memorial hall in melrose massachusetts the World Wrestling Federation was live at the Wichita Coliseum in Wichita, Kansas, Sunday, October the 19th, 1997. In the opening contest, Rocky Maivia and Farouk beat the new Blackjacks. Crush and Janes with the win over Kama and D'Lo Brown. The Patriot defeated the Sultan. WWF Intercontinental Champion Owen Hart retained the title over Dude Love. 
Ken Shamrock victorious over Savio Vega. WWF Tag Team Champions The Legion of Doom retain the titles over the Godwins. And in the main event, WWF World Champion Brett Hitman Hart retain the title over The Undertaker and Hunter Hearst Helmsley. If you were in Wichita Live, share your memories in the comment section below. Use the links in the description box to keep wrestling legends working on our eBay store and on our Patreon streaming service so we can bring you more interactive superstar shoot interviews to relive the good old days of professional wrestling. Check it out. Boston Wrestling Sports and the MWF explodes into a new year with professional wrestling content galore and need you to join our family. Every Tuesday night at 10 p.m. after our Monday Night Raw review, it's Wrestling Inside Us at your house with WWE Hall of Famer Mr. USA Tony Atlas. Wednesday nights at 10 p.m. after NXT and AEW, join rotating legends on Wrestling Insiders Special Edition. Every Thursday night at 10 p.m. after our NXT and Dynamite review, it's Marty Jannetty's No Holds Barred Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll Journey on Wrestling Insiders Party with Marty. Friday night after SmackDown, don't miss John Cena Sr.'s Wrestling Insiders Fabulous Fridays. Plus, look for classic clips, history videos, bonus live episodes, pay-per-view watch-alongs, and more. For less than a cup of coffee at Starbucks, get early ad-free access to our Wrestling Insider talk shows, our acclaimed studio shoot interview DVD library, and help keep wrestling legends working during the worst of times join our growing family at patreon.com backslash boston wrestling expect the unexpected in 2021 wrestling fans welcome back to some great conversation with the former ecw world heavyweight champion just incredible making his wrestling inside his extreme debut but certainly not the final episode we got a lot of great stuff coming up uh, hopefully forget about just into the fall into the winter and into the spring and it's nice to have someone close by uh, yeah. where, you know in a pinch where if you get a cancellation on a booking or something like that That's it. and our studio is open you know I don't want to mention the man from Auburn Maine that drove me nuts but it did him quite well uh, but back to again a young you <laughs> You were enjoying the WWF experience, the craziness that it was, uh, that 80s rock and wrestling boom. Yep. What got you to the point where you said, you know what, I want to do this? It was not until I, I went, because we didn't have, uh, we had cable, but we didn't get WTBS uh, where I lived in Connecticut. And my father and mother had uh, you know, f friends in Danbury, which was about 30 minute drive. We'd go over there almost every other Saturday. For, you know, they had a family, the pool, whatever. So I'd watch on Saturday uh, evenings WTBS. For the first time, I saw Ric Flair. Because before I only, you know, back then, you'd only see them in magazines. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen another promotion, right? And, uh, you know, I really started to become a big fan of the NWA and of Ric Flair, the Road Warriors, and guys like that. The, you know, the Four Horsemen. And uh, eventually, I would say this was 1989, um, NWA was coming to uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Oh, okay. And it was a rare opportunity for me for to the see. Bash, yeah, I think, right? yep, yeah, the Great American Bash and Ricky Steamboat, I believe, was defending the title as the champion. It was one of the rare times where he had the title. Yeah, I think he dropped that it to great Flair. And then, with Flair yep, in '89. And yeah. I got to see Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair uh, in New Haven live. And I must have been a sophomore, sophomore or junior. I think I was a sophomore though in high school, and uh, just changed my life seeing that live and really seeing how masterful it was. And it's a little different when you're watching wrestling live and the lights are just on and it's kind of dark all over the place. The presentation was much different than the WWE. Um, it just, uh, it blew my mind. And the more I was doing, you know, I was going on in high school and the less interested I really did get in the scholastic part of it, which, you know, I, I just, I wish I cared more. I just didn't. I was very smart too, which kind of, uh, you know, killed my parents and uh you know in a way i wish i could have gone back and gone to college or something but um i was doing it in the backyard with my friends you know and i was before like before it was quote unquote right backyard before wrestling. backyard wrestling was a thing we just did it for fun taped it on v just for ourselves to you know role playing but uh, i was already like realizing i'm pretty good at this and i could you know do what they're doing you know so the selling and the i was already ahead of it and um I was like, one day I went to, to work. This was after I graduated high school. I had a job at Stop and Shop, mm -hmm. a local grocery store, uh, pushing carriages and bagging groceries. 15 minute break, I go to the magazines and I'm looking through the wrestling magazines. And in the back, there's a full page ad that said, uh, Hart Brothers Pro Wrestling Camp. 
um, Dare to be great. And it actually had a phone number and address. And this is pre-internet, of course. Yeah, sure. Back then, if you didn't know anybody, you couldn't break into the business. It was tough. You know, you had to know somebody or somebody that knows somebody, knows a wrestler and, you know, a whole song and dance. So you're probably so, talking maybe what, like 91? 89, 90. Oh, 89? Okay. Uh, I was a junior mm -hmm. uh, in high school, junior going on. Yeah, maybe 90, 91. That'd be more accurate. But uh, yeah, from then on, and I called and I spoke to Keith Hart, uh, one of the Hart brothers. And, um, you know, I worked, saved up $3,000. Um, bought a plane ticket, and uh, the summer of 1992, I went to Calgary to train to become a pro wrestler. Wow, yeah. unbelievable. So you actually took that great leap of faith, mm -hmm. unlike so many that try and break into the industry now, yeah. where they have to have a wrestling school within 15 miles of the house right, so they wouldn't right, right. consider it. Well, you what did I it the old school way. Yeah, well, what I don't understand is um, when I went up to the Hearts, it was uh, for two months, uh, five days a week for two hours, and then you get your weekends off, and then after that, Two months is done and you're you're a pro wrestler but you know you don't get a card or somebody what i dislike about the system around here i notice a lot and i'm not uh you know dissing any of the schools or any of the great schools around the areas but what i notice is kids are in these same schools for years and years and years and it's like well, you're trained and you're doing shows like back then it was so different um because you would learn out there you know, you would learn at the shows. You know, that was doing bumps in, in rings uh, in a warehouse isn't going to help you. It's getting out there and hustling it and really taking that leap uh, was what helped me because there was really nothing else. I didn't know anything else. Did they still have some version of Stampede going at that time? Uh, it wasn't Stampede. It was called Rocky Mountain Pro Wrestling, which, funny enough, I came back home for a couple of months. And when they started running, uh, October 16th, 1992, I went back up there for 10 weeks. Had they rest, uh, Every Fridays they'd have shows. And on my 19th birthday, I wrestled my first match out there. Wow. And I think my fourth match was against Chris Jericho. Really? And my seventh match was against Lance Storm. So you were working with some pretty... Yeah. Uh, yeah, a couple uh, of other guys. guys with a lot yeah. of great potential, we'll call mm -hmm. them. A couple of guys had, uh, were wrestling out of uh, Mexico and going to Japan. So it was a nice, I mean, it was still, you know, in front of 150 people. But still, uh, it was, you know, some, some good talent there, and I learned quite a bit. Now, as someone that was paying their dues, breaking in, I mean, how were you living out there? Were you staying at a hotel? Or uh, I was stay staying at, a, at one of the boys' houses. I was staying or? at the, one of the promoters' uh, houses mm -hmm. with uh, one of the kids I went to wrestling school with. Oh. And, uh, you know, I'd have to put up the ring, tear it down, clean all the kinds of, just do, you know, run around for them all week long to promote the shows and just hustling, you know, but I wasn't making any money and uh, literally, and I, I, after I went up there about 220 jacked and at the end of the 10 weeks, I was like 190 pounds really? and uh, it was heading towards Christmas time, Christmas of 92. And I just said, um, I'm done, you know, I just, you know, it was, that, was a, that was as much as, as far as I was going to go out there. And I came back home and um, started doing some indies uh, locally around this area in 93. And then lo and behold, um, in 93, I went to a WWE house show at the old New Haven Coliseum, mm -hmm. funny enough. And you were always told to, you know, go to these tapings. The times were different then, the, you know, security wasn't right. a big deal. You I had to brought, walk down that yep. big ramp. <laughs> I brought my bag. Uh, Tony Gurria and Rene Goulet were there. They were the agents, uh, what they call producers now. Um, but um, I introduced myself. I said, Tony, Mr. You know, Gurria, whatever. Told them I was trained by the Hearts up in Calgary. Uh, oh, you know, that goes I'm a just, long way. Right, wanted to say hello. Um, you know, if you ever need anybody, I'm here. You know, and they said, oh, you could watch. You know, we'll get you a seat. You know, whatever. Very kind. Um, so I watched the show, they didn't need me obviously, and uh, as I was saying goodbye to everyone and uh, thank you very much for letting me watch the show, he goes, well, if, you, if you're ever looking for work, we're starting a, a new show uh, out of Manhattan called Monday Night Raw. We're going to be needing guys to, on, you know, on a weekly, bi-weekly basis to go down there as extras. And I gave him my number and uh, that's how that connection with the WWE started. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. I look at, before we dance away too far <laughs> from the, the wrestling school part of it, you know, what bothers me is, and, I, you know, and here I am, the guy that tries to book a lot of the talent that comes from these sure. schools on our events, but I look at it like, you know what, if you were never a full-time professional wrestler, and that means, yeah. doesn't mean you were a main eventer, you could be at the, look at a journeyman. Johnny Rod. A journeyman. The yeah. bottom of the card. If you never did it full-time, 
How can you teach someone the wrestling business? You yeah. can teach moves, right. but that's like taking a giant 500-piece jigsaw puzzle and dumping it on a table. Correct. Okay, this is a nice little piece. This is one move, but this little piece of a move goes over here. They don't, if they never lived it, they right. can't put that 500-piece jigsaw puzzle. To, in okay. my opinion, they don't know how to put the puzzle together themselves. So how the hell are they supposed to train people right. to do it? Yeah. And what irritates me is... And, and you know, I love I love the talent. Anyone that loves this business as much oh, as course. I do, I want them around me. Sure. But I do get frustrated in the fact that I think it's an odd system where they pay to go to these wrestling schools where they're not getting a true professional wrestling training. Then they go for, to work for these promoters. They're not what they quote unquote could or should be at that point. But we're paying them. <laughs> well, I, I think the biggest problem... It's, it's just, it's kind of odd to me, you know I'm, what I mean? I, yeah, I'm, and you're right. Uh, and I hope I don't get into trouble, but this is just the, the, uh, the, the facts. You with me, you will. <laughs> um, this business was uh, a very select business, going back to the old days. And just for an example, when I went to wrestling camp at the Hearts, uh, 12 of us started, a couple of ladies and uh, 10 or so guys, whatever. Mm -hmm. And by the end of camp, there was only two of us left, and I being one of them. They, Do you remember who the other one was? Uh, Brett Farrell uh, was his real name. He wrestles his big daddy hammer in uh, Toronto. Still does it uh, part-time. Oh, really? Time. Still yeah. works? Well, Still does it. Just do it once in yeah, a while. Yeah. But, um, and the reason they do that is people think, oh, they're just mean. They're trying to take your money. Possibly. Yeah. But they're trying to also see who's tough enough to, to, to deal with the bullshit, um, to, to, to put in the work. To be a pro. And, and there's a lot that and, goes into being I, a pro. And I think with the way the business changed, a lot of these schools are really part of a pay-to-play uh, system where they, you know, if you want to be on this show, you've got to be part of this school, or you've got to pay or sell this many tickets, whether you're good or not, whether you, whether you should be in the ring or not. I was at a show last night that I participated in. Uh, the show was fantastic uh, out in Ludlow. Great, ho great house and everything. But a, a lot of the kids were just god awful, and they've been doing it forever. I've been there for a couple of years now, doing it. You know, whenever they have shows, and they never change. They never get better, and it's because they just go there and they, they think they know what they're doing, and they they're more worried about who's going over and is my music right, and, and instead of oh. you know, it's just it's it's we let too many people in, because they, they, back then they would have never allowed these kids to step in the ring much less to, to be running shows. And now you have hundred. there's more fans than there are, or there's more boys than there are fans because we, we let them in. We, could, we shouldn't have let them in. The, 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 the club be, became too big. It turned into me, from my point of view, Little League Baseball. Yep. If you get on with 100 bucks, you're guaranteed to play three innings. Right. No matter how good, right. how bad you may be, you're in. And you're, quote, unquote, one of the boys. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how they refer to the females now. If they're called one of the boys. I don't know. I'm afraid to One of the there. girls. I mean, <laughs> I'm afraid to even we'll mention We'll probably it. get into trouble even if you ask <laughs> yeah, nowadays. So. You get into, you'll offend someone no matter what. Yeah. But, I mean, man, it's just it's frustrating to me because, again, they're genuinely good human beings. They, oh, they yeah. want to do it. They yes. want to learn. Yes. They want to know. And everybody I'm talking about, I mean, most of them are stand-up guys yeah, and gals. Yeah, good human you know? beings. Yeah. But, it's just, unfortunately... The route they've gone hasn't been, let me pack up my bag and go learn from Al right. Snow. Let me right. go pack up my bag and learn from the Dudleys down in Florida. Let right. me go pack up my bag and go to some of the, the really good schools they have out west. And everybody wants to be close to home. I, in eastern Massachusetts, I can think of four schools off the top of my head within 45 minutes to an hour of each right. other. Are there that many true athletes that have it to become pro wrestlers that we right. need? Four schools right. within 45 minutes of each other? Come on. Yeah. And that's what angers me. Thank you, Captain Lou. Um, have you ever thought about opening a school yourself? I have. I have. And I, I, but it's just, again, I think it's oversaturation. Um, yeah. You yeah, know, again, do I need... And again, again, from, we, for a real pro to say that, yeah, compared I, to what's out there I, now. I, I, yeah. I mean, we already have uh, Slick Wagner Brown, who's a good friend of mine, has a phenomenal... I love Slick. Slick has a great school out near Hartford. Uh, Paul Roma has a school out in Bridgeport, so and they're he both. Was a pro. Yeah, he was full time. And uh, there's, you know, that's 30 minutes from my house. So how, again, like yeah. you say, how many wrestling schools? How many wrestlers do we really need? I don't you know, know if you've ever watched our Thursday night series that we do with Marty, but he has this idea about opening all these schools in Florida, and I didn't want to <laughs> burst his bubble, yeah. but I'm like, Marty, do you realize how many schools there, there are, are down in that area? 
But, you know, if that's what he wants to do, but the problem, he wants but to But then once again, it becomes about trying to make money off of kids that want to be wrestlers but have no business being in the wrestling business. And what we're doing is we're diluting the wrestling business. Piss it on. And uh, there's no regulation, so who's to say that they, who can do it and who cannot do it? So I think that's been a big problem, and that's just allowed... It, it hurts the business because, like, okay, if you're, if you're, a, I see fans, or fans, let me backtrack. I see a lot of the men and women that are out there on the indies, ringside at Raw, ringside at AEW, and then I'm working with you on a, you know, I would have never, the, the hearts would have kicked my ass if I was paid for a ticket anywhere. You don't. You know, even when I was a kid, I knew that. When I first came from Calgary, nobody had to tell me that. I wasn't going to pay for a ticket to a WWE show because you're one of the boys. If you're an NBA or a professional ball player, you want to go to a show, you, you, you call somebody at the office and you say, can I come to the show? You don't pay a ticket. And I think we got to stop acting like marks and act like professionals. And very few people do that. And I don't know why. Maybe that lesson hasn't been taught, but maybe it's two different worlds. But until we do that as a whole, it's going to be a problem. We're going to have oversaturation of men and women. And a lot of them really don't belong and that's a shame I hate to say that because everybody should have an opportunity to do what they love but do you and you know what I'm saying I, I agree with you 110 percent and the one thing I think maybe that a lot of these guys and now girls miss out on is there's a lot of things you can do in wrestling that don't involve doesn't have you to, have be, to in, be in right, the ring right you know what I mean there's ring crew there's you know so much support staff that's needed if you're working for a quality Absolutely. promotion that's helping promote a what, a, what, a, what a concept uh, street you know, teamwork yeah. and things like that but Again, someday, because what I find, obviously, but amusing to some degree, is that every time we have a true pro come in and sure. we have a conversation, it's almost verbatim what you said, just maybe with slightly different words and slightly different experiences, right. you know? The whole industry, I don't know if you heard the, the recent mandate that's been going around on uh, social media about WWE, they don't want to hire indie talent anymore. They want to go out, they want to find... Sure. Yeah. And uh, foot, college football players, they couldn't make it to the NFL. Right. Collegiate wrestlers, people with great and, size, and the reason, they can make superstars. And the reason why is, and again, I, you know, you could just say the, this. I was one of those guys, but very few people now. The indies uh, produce smaller athletes in general. Yes. Um, when I was coming up in the Hearts, I was two twenty, jacked, gassed to the gills, and I was, uh, I was, Owen and I were the smallest ones in in, in the locker room. Um, so in, in, in the WWE, that has now changed. It used to be Brett, Sean, myself, one, two, three kid at that smaller size. Now we would be considered Randy Orton size, almost bigger. One, two, three kid would be one of the bigger guys on the now, roster yeah. right now. And so and he I, was the midget. And I think you know guys like Adam Cole, and even though they're tremendous wrestlers, they look awesome, like little children. They look very small. And I think what Vince wants is uh, a guy that's six five, six six, looks like Razor Ramon larger than life and people like that don't necessarily want to get into pro wrestling like they used to a lot of the stories you hear from back in the day scott hall 18 19 year old kid got into the wrestling business because barry windham and uh, mike rotunda came into the strip club he used to bounce said he was a big guy and they started to talk he goes hey i need to get into this business scott asked he goes oh this that and the other thing because you look great and that's the whole thing is that look not everybody's six five six six that can do this you know i'm certainly not but i you know there's other you know what i mean yeah. if you're if you're five foot five and 125 pounds not everybody's ray mysterio not one saying is, you can't one is okay not saying you can't but, but not everybody not everybody and that's where vince is having a hard time with nxt and smaller guys smaller you know athletes and i think you know what if you <laughs> want to have a promotion filled with them sure i think that's cool yeah but if you bring up a guy like adam cole in a wwe ring <clears> on raw or smackdown I think he's going to look awfully tiny. Yeah. And that's not, I think he's a, a great talent. Sure. But, dot, 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 is he the type of guy that they're going to want to put on that marquee to try and sell 80,000 tickets at a WrestleMania? Right. And right. I think that's what they're after right now. Yeah. And those little, you know, $250 a month wrestling schools are not producing that type of talent. No. So, Very few guys that, that fit that physical attribute that they're looking for back then it was like uh, you know football players would want to be pro wrestlers it was almost like if you didn't make it it was a national it was a trans natural transition if you were a, a wrestler coming out of uh, college and you didn't make it in you know whatever because wrestling there's no major leagues like after you're done on the collegiate level right like the Brock Lesnar's of the world you yep. get into that there's very few of that going on anymore 
you know. I, I just remember quickly again before we go to break, okay, before Captain Lou castrates me, but the, I remember I was 13 when I broke in through this actual studio. Tony okay. Rumble came down to yep. promote his show on a wrestling talk show, saw all the equipment, and he said, why don't you come and tape it? Yeah. And we did, and I remember 13-year-old kid, ninth grade, you know, sure. you, you quote unquote know, like we were talking about earlier, you know, there's something that's not real. Right. But this was a locker room filled with men, men. that would kick your fucking ass men. if you disrespected them or what they did. And that is missing now, as Kevin Nash, Men's I men. think. Yeah. One of the, the great quotes that Kevin Nash came up with on an interview I came across on YouTube, he says, now it looks like they have a bunch of Abercrombie and Fitch models. It's true. <laughs> it's true. And these were back in the day, like when you'd meet, there were crusty, big, nasty men. Yeah, absolutely. All right, wrestling fans, right now we're going to take a brief time out. We come back, unfortunately, we're going to wrap up the show. Stand by. <laughs> Wrestling fans, the countdown is on to Boston Wrestling MWF's 20th anniversary bash Saturday night, November the 13th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Massachusetts. Join WWE Hall of Famers Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Bob Backlund, Marty Jannetty, the Doctor of Style Slick, the Berserker, Doink the Clown, Duke the Dumpster Drossy, Aldo Montoya, plus JTG of Crime Time, two-time Impact Wrestling World Champion Die Hard Eddie Edwards, John Cena Sr. and Oscar of Men on a Mission for live wrestling, an autograph photo fan fest, VIP Q&A session with the kickoff to the Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive in a must-see event two decades in the making. VIP packages and tickets are on sale now at bostonwrestling.com. We'll see you live in Melrose November 13th. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm Mr. USA WWE Hall of Famer Tony Atlas. The road to WrestleMania has begun. Wrestling fans are looking to add to their man caves. You got to see what we have in the eBay store. Check it out. Here's your chance to own a piece of history from the 2020 WWE Draft. On the second night, October the 12th, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, and Alexa Bliss unleashed hell on Andrade and Zelina Vega. This limited edition 11x14 collector's poster is number 26 of only 50 made, personally signed by both The Fiend and Alexa Bliss, direct from friends at WWE. Comes with Certificate of Authenticity hologram on the poster itself, suitable for framing. You'll also receive a bonus autograph mystery photo and an on-air shout out as our thanks to you get this ultra rare autograph fiend and alexa bliss poster now ah uh, see ya why hello i would ask what was on your mind but i already know you want to know what has got my beard looking oh so majestic and i'll tell you it's sexy as hell beard king Coconut oil, vitamin E oil, almond oil, both sweet and bitter, shea butter, it's all natural. Yes, JTG has actually come out with a high quality product. So support your boy by going to sahbeardcare.com and take one step closer to becoming sexy as hell. <laughs> Cheer. <laughs> Ooh, cheer. <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right, wrestling fans, welcome back to Wrestling Inside is Extreme. It's the premiere of our new friend, Just Incredible. We had six tremendous weeks of New Jack. Just Incredible's down the road. You know, we, we could be seeing him as much as we saw our old buddy F. and Arvin. But, you know, I think it'll make for more interesting conversation as long as we don't get into everything that was on CNN that week but that's a different story for a, a <laughs> I know where you're time. going with that and I'll stay away <laughs> from it um, tell me this April of 1994 Gardner Massachusetts you came to one of Tony's shows with Paul Roma yes uh, and you were not PJ Walker you were Suicide Samson where the yeah. heck did that name come from was that a Tony thing that was, was a Tony thing oh he wanted to create his own persona yeah. Oh, yeah. okay Yep, he was trying to do something a little different, and uh, yeah, it was uh, totally, uh, I forget about that, but uh, yeah, that, that happened, you know? And I think we only did one or two shows, if I'm not mistaken. You didn't mistaken. work much for him. I no. tell you, you were a guy that I thought was really good. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm still young yeah. and, and, and green, but uh, yeah, no, but it was, it, I don't remember much of it. I remember it was at a high school. In Godden, Massachusetts, yeah. yeah. Steve Kern worked his doink. That's right. 
Damon That's right. Demento was trying to reinvent himself as I think it was he was called 3D. It was oh, okay. an all purple gimmick and he wore a mask because his stint and WWF was yeah. pretty much coming to an end. Yeah. So he was trying to come up with something to stay relevant. What a good, what a good look him. he had, too. I mean, if you're talking 1960s, 1970s wrestling, he would have looked like a top guy in every territory, wouldn't what, he? What, yeah, I'm still surprised, that though, that they couldn't... Those movements yeah, they couldn't had. pull that off because the yeah. costume looked great. He yeah. looked great, but... You know how it goes sometimes. Yeah. When there's limited options, yeah. you only have a couple of opinions to go by. Back in that's true through the yeah. early '80s, you know it was like Major League Baseball. There were 25, 30 different teams you could go and play right. for and make a full-time living at yep. it. Maybe not the big money that the guys right. get nowadays, yep. but a full-time living to take care of your family and yourself. Right. Yep. And unfortunately, it is what it is. But I just I, I never forget that. That was one guy where I was so young. I wasn't one to make suggestions to someone like Tony, who sure. I, you know, not that I ever saw him on TV, but I did know him from wrestling magazines, right. and you yep. know, I was impressed to say I was ringing his bell. Yep. I was playing his oh, yeah. music. Yeah. I was listed. I was taping the match sheet to the wall and sure. the things because I got into it through the TV production. But he saw after a couple of shows, and he got to know me a little bit. I had an aptitude for the wrestling part of it. The right. TV production stuff was fun. Yeah. I didn't give a fuck about that. Right, right. I wanted to do the wrestling stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? Sure. And that, that's when the great adventure began for me in high school, and I had to work my parents into saying, well, this will be great for my college resume that I'm doing all this production work with the wrestling. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's great. And to, but the one thing about Tony is uh, he had a very, very big name yeah. in, in the area. Yeah. You know, uh, everybody knew who he was. So he was a bit of a local legend, you know, around the, the you know, Boston wrestling, and uh, that, was, that was pretty cool, you know, he'd been around a long time. Hell of a college basketball player, too. Oh, was he really? People didn't realize. I yeah, didn't hell know of that. a college basketball. I don't remember if it was, was it BU or was it UMass? I don't remember what school, but I mean, he was, he was pretty good. Huh. Uh, and, and the sad thing is, you know, I think he knew the whole time. He wasn't going to live to, to be an old age. Both of his parents had a, a heart disease, mm. and they died in their early 40s. And mm. I think he was 44 when he passed. I know it's he the was same young, day yeah. as Eddie Guerrero. I didn't know him that well. Yeah. You know, very just in passing. But uh, yeah, I knew he was young. That's a shame. Well, what he did for me, I, I'll be eternally grateful to him. There are still times, again, I don't know what, how, what kind of a, a spiritual person you are, but I reach out to him and my thoughts. And my buddy Percy and another guy named the Jackal that was instrumental in what Tony did and uh, it was tough and that's what led to, originally that was what was going to lead to our promotion starting mm. and then that's when as I told you I met Ed Cohen and right. I had my okay. tremendous lengthy nine months <laughs> working with them before they started to have the need to bring in X amount of people that were with the WCW yes, at yes, that yes. point from their offices down in Georgia and they didn't need people that weren't full time around. So, right, but you know right. what? I'll always look back at it on what a gift from Tony. Yes. What a gift from Ed. What that man did for me. Yeah. I'll never forget the call. We had a show on a Saturday night, and after the SmackDown taping, our friend Sue called me, and let me know that he had passed. And it, one of the worst feelings in my life still is that I couldn't go to his services mm. because we had the event that night. Oh, and X-Pac, Sean and I, we did a great tribute to him in the ring. And he said, you know you'd, he'd kick your ass if you missed this event yeah. to go to his wake. And isn't that the crazy thing about our industry? And that he, it is. He was 110% right. It is that crazy. He would have kicked my ass if I skipped that show to go to his services. Yeah. But under normal human circumstances, sure. you wouldn't give it a second thought. You'd go to the services. He was, he was one of the true uh, nicest people ever. Like, I remember one thing about him, and um, i never forget it. My dad used to always talk to Percy. My dad would go backstage. Oh, really? Yeah, and, you know, because he was friends with a bunch of, you know, because I'd been around since I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. My old man was always welcome back there. Used to well, sneak, that's great. He used to sneak beers to Arn Anderson uh, on Sundays if we had house shows around mm -hmm. here because uh, they'd close on Sundays. Oh, they would drive So my dad yep. would go to, you know, come from home with a, with a case of beer for Arn, but he'd see Percy once in a while and uh, always called him Mr. Polacco. And my father always thought that was so cool, you know what I mean? Because, you know, they, they'd see him on TV get a kick out of it. But, and Percy was always so nice to the family and to everyone around, you know what I mean? It always stood out, always stood out, and I'll never forget that stuff. Oh, I don't want to get going because I'll go in that direction, but... I, I still miss the man every day. Um, so, 
as my brain continues to, to, to drift now as we went in that direction. But certainly Raw, they turned that into the show of the unexpected. Mm. Um, I don't think cost-wise, where they were looking for something cheap, Manhattan Center real estate yeah. <laughs> was not cheap. No. But what no. a... What an awesome, cool venue. Just literally a block away from MSG yep. down there. Yep. What were your first impressions of the Manhattan side? I don't want to get too, too much into no. WWF yeah. because where this is an ECW theme show. But sure, sure. I, no. I want to look at the early part of your career, too. It, it, was, uh, it was like a big old ballroom, you know, and uh, we were dressed. It wasn't a good, you know, they didn't have big dressing rooms. You're just dressing sometimes on, in hallways yeah. and stuff. Um, but what was more... What was amazing to me now, especially looking back to was then, like you would go into the arena part and that was almost like silence, dead silence. Everything would be set up. There was no pyro or big stages then, um, you know, back then. And so you'd go into the ring and ringside, it was silent. Like you couldn't hear anything. Whereas today, everybody's in there doing bumps and practicing 50 million things. All the action was in the locker room because and I remember running the ropes for the first time on my first TV taping there, and every like people that were at ringside kind of stopped to look at me, and I was like, that's kind of weird, because if you were out there working stuff out, almost like they would look at you if you're unprofessional, you don't know, you know what I mean? You didn't want to smarten anybody up, because kayfabe was still a, sure. very much a thing yep, in 93, absolutely. 94 even, and people may not think so, but so that just, the, the difference in, then to today is just, even for the WWE, which now has walkthroughs and stuff like that, which I think is, to this day, I think it's still a mistake because these, all mistake. of these people are very capable of doing it the way we used to do it. Why do you have to walk through and, and have all of the, you know what I mean? You're professionals. You know how to do this stuff, you know? You know I Silly. Don't, I don't want to knock Ronda Rousey, but even at the point where they would, you know, give her a week, to practice a pay-per-view match at a hotel room where they'd set up a ring in a ballroom or something like yeah. that. And I, you know what, the funny thing is, one of the guys that works here, he's, a, he's actually a professor at Harvard. His wife did judo with uh, Ron Duran Wakefield Mass, which oh, okay. is just down the road. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it, it, to me, is that pro wrestling? I don't or is that is. Cirque du Soleil? It's or whatever Cir they it's call Cirque that du Soleil. Vegas. It, yeah. it, is, it is something completely different than professional wrestling. I don't know what that is, um, but <laughs> it is. I think everybody's trying to figure out what yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, no, because, I mean, there's, listen, there's, I remember working with guys that uh, wanted me to, to, to remember everything and go through a million things, and I'd watch myself back and I would notice that my character was a bit off or I was a bit, wor you almost are, you're in there thinking, and the last thing you need to be doing when you're in there is thinking what's next. You know, and uh, you, you shouldn't do that because, like, I could tell my character, I wasn't able to be my character. I was thinking I was in my head too much. You should go out there and call a lot of it out. You know, you should have a line, like a, an outline. Because mm -hmm. if you're worried about memorizing, you're not going to be able to shine when the lights are on you and the camera and you're able to ad-libbing some of the, even in, in movies, some of the best stuff is those unscripted parts that, you know, an, a great actor might improv. You know, improvisational, I mean, look, it, it, it doesn't take um, rocket science to know if Ric Flair chops you and you chop him back or an exchange happens. You know, I think pro wrestlers have done it long enough that you know how to get into and out of exchanges that may pop up. You know, it's, it's, it's sad. We've, we've, we've let it, I, I, got, I was a special guest referee at a show last night. That shows those, those guys I was telling you about where not a lot of people knew how to work. And it was literally embarrassing where they were shooting each other off the ropes, nobody knowing where to go with it, um, missed move. I mean, it was just something that, if I, was, if I were to do that, if you, you were told if you were to get shot off the ropes and the person doing it didn't call a spot, you were either the hold on so you don't look bad or just clobber them, knock them the F out, you know, so to prevent yourself from looking. Bad. And it's like and exposing the business. It was, and that was, a, I mean, last night was an expose. <laughs> and it's a shame because I like all of these people very much. Yeah, again, you very know, much. I think 99.9% you know? .9 of the people that want to get into our industry, they do it for all the right reasons. Yeah. They love what they see. Yeah. You know, there are some that just think, oh, this is going to be my, you know, I'm going to be a Bella twin and this is going to be my right. ticket on to reality shows and things like that. But for those that get into wrestling because yeah. they want to get into wrestling, the yeah, hot is in the right place. Yeah. They're yeah. genuinely good people. Yeah. They just 
and 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 they were doing hardcore stuff, oh, which and oh. then, but they're working the hardcore stuff. I was like, guys, if you choose to go down the hardcore route, you got to take it, or else don't choose to do it because right. it looked even worse, you know. It, it's and that's that's the sad part. It's like you got to stay in your wheelhouse. And uh, there's nothing you know. that looks worse than a, a weak jazz shot when they. We, and, you know then, I mean? and, they, and then they were also doing that very weak and then putting their hands up at the same time, even weaker. It's like, bro, my, my son could have taken that. Yeah, that's what it does. It looks like little kids up. having fun time. Thank yeah. you, Captain. It Lord. does. It really does. It, it, that's not what I do. It drives me insane. And yeah. that's why I'm such a stickler for, you know, I, we have, if you look at one of our shows, we have guys that come from so many different parts of the country because mm -hmm. I just don't want the garbage. I think if you don't give the fans quality, they're not going to respect what you do and they're not going to want to come back. One of the biggest problems in our industry is this. I think there are so many levels of independent wrestling. And then, but then you go to some indie shows where nobody in, belongs in a ring. No. And the problem is the fans don't know, people may not be educated to the names of these promotions because there's so many, you may not be hip to it. If you're a mom and dad taking a kid to a show and you see what I saw last night, that's, the, that's a disservice to pro wrestling because you might, up the road might have been a really good show and you'll say, I'm never going to bring never, my kids to this again. We're all under the same, the same umbrella. same umbrella. And then that causes a problem, not just for, for you, know, you and me, but for the whole industry. And the, that's why I wish there was some kind of way that we could prevent that. Some kind of regulation that wouldn't, we're, you know, the independents are tough where it wouldn't be a huge financial burden, if right. that makes sense. Yeah. If there was a way to commission, you know, the, the, Just when you in broke a in, when I was yeah. around as a kid, wrestling regulated itself. If right. you didn't belong, kick right. the fuck out you're of You're blacklisted get up. Bye -bye. or blackballed. You're not coming yeah, back. Yeah, you're not working anymore. But like you said, when, or as I said, when we got to the Little League baseball portion right. of it, it's everywhere. I mean, it's... <laughs> there should be something along yeah. the lines of, uh, that just at least recognizes you're run by professionals and you're putting a professional product out there. And if you're not with this group, but then of course you get politics involved. But like if you're not with this, then it's considered mud hole wrestling like Jim Cornette likes to call it. But man, it's gotta be a way. There's gotta be a way because it, it's just, you know, it's sad, it's sad out there sometimes. You know, I, I, I don't understand it. why at some point, especially now with Vince McMahon, they made that mandate about the independence. Why not create? WWE light shows around the country. Yeah, you know what I mean. As opposed yeah. to just doing, you know, they do those Florida loops for the NXT talent, and yeah. at other times with the bigger name NXT talent tour the country. But why not WWE try and brand itself? You know, with high school fundraisers, and, and at a time you were around when they used sure. to do a lot oh, of yeah. those types of shows. I still did a lot of the high when schools. the yeah. um, when business was really down. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just to give the guys work. Why not try and come up with your own form of independent wrestling, where at least yeah. it has, if you have that stamp on it, at least you know it is someone that is a true pro right. or is getting to the point of being a true pro, right. as opposed to, again, the kid in Little League Baseball, you know, that couldn't hit the ball if his life depended on it, but he's paying $250 a month, mm -hmm. so we got to put him on the show. Right. That's yeah. what's killed it to me, and that's what makes it so frustrating for the events we run. But that's a different story <laughs> for a different time. My good friend Captain Lou Data from the Goonies was just out here. He gave us the signal. Unfortunately, we got to go. It's almost like the end of the old Saturday Night's main events on NBC when they'd play Take Me Home. Uh, I remember that. <laughs> that's a good one. But the good news is next Tuesday night, Just Incredible is going to be back with us. Yes. And we're going to dive uh, uh, officially into his world of ECW. We get to know the man a little bit here. Uh, we're going to get to know much more about his time in ECW on Wrestling Inside is Extreme. We thank you very much for joining us. If you're watching during the Tuesday night premiere after NXT, we love all of your little comments in the comment section. The Super Chat button is always open for business. Uh, if you are not watching the premiere, shame on you. <laughs> but you can still leave comments in the comment section below. Give the show a big thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. It's free. All of those little things. It lets YouTube know that you like us. And it showcases us to the millions of fans that don't know we exist. Because, you know, after the 80s boom, a lot of fans left pro wrestling and never came back. After the Attitude Era and the Monday Night War, a lot of fans left and never came back. But once they find cool talk shows like these, as we've seen with the continued rapid growth, I think they're going to find us and I think they're going to love us. Absolutely. All right, wrestling fans, for Just Incredible, I'm Dan Marotti. We'll see you next Tuesday night. After WWE NXT, be happy, be healthy, be safe, 
Good night from Boston. Wrestling fans, the countdown is on to Boston Wrestling MWF's 20th anniversary bash Saturday night, November the 13th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Massachusetts. Join WWE Hall of Famers Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Bob Backlund, Marty Jannetty, the Doctor of Style Slick, the Berserker, Doink the Clown, Duke the Dumpster Drossy, Aldo Montoya, plus JTG of Crime Time, two-time Impact Wrestling World Champion Die Hard Eddie Edwards, John Cena Sr. and Oscar of Men on a Mission for for live wrestling, an autographed photo fan fest, VIP Q&A session with the kickoff to the Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive in a must-see event two decades in the making. VIP packages and tickets are on sale now at bostonwrestling.com. We'll see you live in Melrose November 13th. Thank you for joining us. Please give the video a big thumbs up. Leave us a comment and subscribe to the channel to enjoy more great content. Don't forget, you can help keep wrestling legends working. Check out our eBay store and join the Boston Wrestling family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling so we can produce more in-depth shoot interviews.